fashion. Personality you can buy. It's what makes some people look fun and fabulous and what makes most men in their 20s wear variations of a plaid button-up shirt every single day. <laughs> Listen, I've decided I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to wear versions of this until I'm dead. That's it. <laughs> We buy a lot of clothes in this country. In 2013, Americans purchased, on average, 64 items per person. And we're able to do that because clothing is incredibly cheap these days. As you'd know if you've ever turned on your TV in the morning. The price of this dress shocked a lot of people in our office. $39.99. Blows me away. Isn't it great? Kohl's, Elsie by Lauren Conrad, $35. That's $35. amazing. This is a dress by Norma Kamali. It is $24 at Walmart. Get out. Get out. Seriously, get out. Security, get her out of here. There is no way that dress is $24. Go f yourself. You're a liar. You lied to me. And look, look, for the consumer, Low prices are fantastic, and nowadays those clothes will even look good because trendy clothing is cheaper than ever and cheap clothing is trendier than ever. And this is largely thanks to the rise of so-called fast fashion retailers that produce stylish, incredibly low-cost clothing like H&M, uh, Zara and Forever 21, uh, the brand that enables Midwestern tweens to dress like 40-something alcoholics attending the funeral of a Tel Aviv nightclub owner. <laughs> and it's a, it's a powerful look. And a big part of all these brands' appeal is that there's always something new to buy. Just look at H&M's rate of turnover. Stores are replenished daily. From the streets to the runway, the latest trends are scoured and can go from a sketch to the rack in as little as three weeks. We have new garments coming into the stores uh, almost every day. So if you go to an H&M store today and come back two days later, you will always find something new. Yes, uh, one day maybe you'll find a shirt and it shares rise and swag. Uh, maybe next day you find shirt with pardon my swag. And uh, maybe next day after that you find cocaine dusted copy of nylon magazine in a fitting room. Something new at H&M always. <laughs> always. H&M's prices are so competitive that a few years back they put out a dress that cost just $4.95. Think about that. That means you could take a $5 bill, scotch tape it over your genitals, <laughs> and you'd be wearing a more expensive piece of clothing. <laughs> I went online, and a jar of cricket food costs $5. A bunch of weird orange cubes you feed to a bug are worth five cents more than this dress. That dress is only seven cents more than a DVD of the Ghost of Girlfriend's Past. <laughs> Inexpensive DVD raves variety. And yet, somehow, fast fashion companies are massively profitable. The chairman of H&M is the 28th richest person in the world. And the co-founder of Zara is the fourth richest person in the world. That means people who own oil fields are worth less than a guy who makes distressed jean shorts. <laughs> Buying clothes is cheaper and easier than ever. And not just at fast fashion companies, traditional retailers have lowered their prices as well, which means the only way brands make money is through volume. And that's why even basics like jeans now go through fashion cycles with the lifespan of mayflies. Obviously, the big trend is skinny jeans. Mm. So for spring, forget about the skinny jean. Now okay. it's all about the flare mm, jean. Boyfriend jeans are the big thing for spring. Jonah is wearing the it jean of the season, and that is the baggy jean. She's marrying these two trends that have been so controversial, yeah. the culotte and, and the denim. denim. We got a denim culotte. Denim culottes. <laughs> Finally, an answer to the question, what if an 18th century cabin boy was also Canadian? <laughs> As great as all these stylish, cheap clothes are, at a certain point, it's hard not to look at those prices and wonder, how does any clothing company make money? Although, let's be honest, you know the answer to that. Half of our clothing used to be made in the United right. States as recently as 1990. It is remarkable, and today, 2%. 2%. 2% of the clothes we wear are made here. That's right. We produce clothes almost entirely overseas, where it's much cheaper. And if 98% of your products could be made abroad, you should really start changing your name to reflect that fact. So, American Eagle should really become Bangladeshi Swamp Hen. <laughs> and Banana Republic should really become... Actually, that one is fine. They, <laughs> they... They got ahead of themselves there for once. And... And look, I know you think you've heard this story before, because you have. 
If you remember, in the 1990s, sweatshops were a key point of outrage. Companies like Gap and Nike were protested. And then, of course, most famously, there was this. Kathy Lee Gifford said she was shocked to learn that a clothing line bearing her name was manufactured, at least in part, in sweatshops and by underage workers. Yes, Kathy Lee's clothing line was caught using child labor, which was surprising, given how kindly she'd always treated the small elderly boy who co-hosted her show. <laughs> and the outcry over sweatshops wasn't just loud, it got some results. Kathy Lee even testified in front of Congress. We are now morally compelled to ask each of us, what can we do to protect labor rights in factories around the world and right here in America? And given that it was my own neglect that compelled us to ask this important moral question, I say to you all, you are welcome. Now let's start day drinking. Come on, what's wrong with you people? It's after 9 a.m. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Good morning. But amazingly, and I know this is hard to hear, Kathy Lee did not solve everything. In fact, <laughs> there has been a pattern of troubling behaviour in the garment industry for the past 20 years. Just look at Gap, the nation's number one supplier of polo shirts for frat guys to vomit on. <laughs> Back in the 90s, uh, they were criticised for labour abuses at a factory making their clothes in El Salvador. In response, they agreed to start an independent monitoring programme which sounded pretty good to everyone. Besides, they had that fun ad where idiots in ill-fitting khaki swing danced, so we, we kind of forgot all about it. Until five years later, when the BBC visited a factory making Gap clothing in Cambodia. We'd been told there were some children here making clothes for the Gap. This is Sun Tida. She's 12 years old. She told the factory she's 18. This is Chan Sita. She's 14. She, too, lied to get the job. Monitors never questioned either of them. Oh, come on, that is no excuse. If a child gained entry to a bar using a Pinkberry punch card as a fake ID, <laughs> it's the fucking bar's fault. Oh, uh, it says here your uh, middle name is One Free Topping. Cool middle name, have fun in there. <laughs> in response, Gap revoked approval of that factory and enhanced their age verification requirements, which sounded pretty good. Besides, it was the year 2000, and they had that ad campaign where pastel morons did the mambo. So we kind of forgot all about it again. Until seven years after that, when a British newspaper visited a workshop in India. According to a published report, these children aged 10 to 13 were working as virtual slaves, stitching embroidered shirts for Gap kids. OK, stop. Having children make clothes for Gap is bad enough. Having them make clothes for Gap kids is somehow worse. Hey, uh, make a beautiful shirt that's exactly your size. We'll ship it around the world. It'll be worn once and thrown away. Now make a thousand more for me. <laughs> in response, Gap said it didn't know its clothes were in that workshop and demanded its supplier make significant improvements to its oversight of subcontractors. And everyone felt better, especially because it was 2007. <laughs> And Gap had just had that mind-blowingly cool holiday in your hood campaign with Common. Fell into the gap, they rock in the hood. Seen peace in the streets when I stopped in the hood. We gon' keep it alive like hip hop in the hood. Oh. <laughs> Look, I know we're talking about child labor, but that may be the saddest that I've felt so far. <laughs> then in 2010, a fire broke out at a factory in Bangladesh that produced Gap clothing, killing 29 workers. After that, Gap launched a building and fire safety plan, which was great, because it meant nothing alarming concerning Gap's presence in Bangladesh was ever going to happen again. Until 2013, when Al Jazeera found this. There's no fire extinguisher, no fire exit. It's just a shack in someone's backyard. How old are you? How long have you been working here? <laughs> It says Old Navy. Old Navy is owned by Gap Inc. Yeah, I guess at this point it seems sweatshops aren't one of those 90s problems we got rid of, like Donnie Wahlberg. <laughs> They're more like one of those 90s problems we're still very much dealing with, like Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> now, Gap says. Those Old Navy jeans were rejected products sold without their knowledge and never ended up in their stores. And look, all brands in the industry have problems. Gap is by no means the worst. And if you ask Gap, as we did, 
they'll point out they've made real improvements and tried as hard as they can to fix all this. But think about that. That means a company trying as hard as it can has been not infrequently connected to labour violations in multiple countries over two decades. And when you weigh all this up, it seems the only situation in which Gap could claim to be unambiguously helpful to people is when someone shits their pants directly outside one of their stores. <laughs> oh, I never thought I'd say this, but thank God Gap is here to help. <laughs> you people are angels. <laughs> and one of the biggest problems with holding many brands accountable is that deniability seems to have been stitched into the supply chain. Look at Walmart. They insist they hold their suppliers to high safety standards. But CBS visited a factory in Bangladesh making clothes for Walmart and found otherwise. The boss at Mondi Apparels, Masadul Haq Chowdhury, showed us an evacuation map marking the location of 13 fire extinguishers. But nearly all of them were missing. Well, if they're not there, then that's not a map. It's an aspirational poster for fire safety. <laughs> If that factory does not conform to Walmart safety standards, how were their clothes there? The managers told us the factory hasn't been approved by Walmart for production, but they still had an order for a million Walmart boxer shorts subcontracted to them by another factory. I see. So Walmart sent it to an approved factory, and that factory sent it to an unapproved factory without Walmart's knowledge. It's just a crazy, one in a million, random accident that's only happened multiple times over the past few years. Walmart say their clothing suppliers in Bangladesh were doing business with the factory without their knowledge. One of its suppliers subcontracted part of the order to Tazreen without their permission. The order was placed with a troubled factory without its knowledge. It had no idea production ever happened there. And this is not the first time Walmart has been caught unaware. No, it's not. And, and they are losing the right to act surprised. They're like the characters in the Hangover movies. It's, <laughs> it's not an accident the third time, boys. It's a pattern of reckless behaviour which has to be addressed. <laughs> one of you is going to wind up dead, probably the one who's never on the poster. And look, since the 90s, we've sporadically cared about this, including two years ago this week after the Rana Plaza building collapse. Five days after that deadly building collapse in Bangladesh, rescuers continue to pull survivors from the rubble. New pictures overnight show dramatic rescues, some using their bare hands to free those who are still trapped. At least 360 people have been killed, hundreds more still missing. That building collapse ended up killing more than 1,100 people. Everyone was justifiably horrified, and that report aired on the Today Show, so you know that everyone there heard it. We then found out that brands like Joe Fresh and The Children's Place had been made in Rana Plaza, and we were horrified again. And yet we get so blinded by low prices that just a few months later, the Today Show was doing this. This adorable sequin bag is from the Children's Place. I found it for under $10. Wow. Love that. So you don't want to spend a ton of money because you're going to spill something on it. I found this one, which is a silk poly blend from yeah. Joe Fresh. Yeah. Touch it. Still feels yeah, really it's good. Yeah, very nice. 19 if we hadn't felt bucks. this one. 19 bucks. Get out. Get out. Get the f*** out of the studio <laughs> and think about what you're doing. Because one of the ladies cooing over that $19 Joe Fresh blouse is Kathy Lee Gifford. And if she can forget the human cost of shockingly cheap clothing, then that is not, in that case, actually that surprising. Her brain is basically pickled in Chardonnay at this point. <laughs> but it doesn't give you much hope for everyone else. Look, this is going to keep happening as long as we let it. So we need to show clothing brands not just that we care, but why they should. So we have a little surprise for the leaders of some of these companies. I'm talking specifically about the heads of H&M, of Walmart, of Gap, of Joe Fresh and of the Children's Place. I've bought all of you lunch, which will be turning up to your office tomorrow. Now, full disclosure, <laughs> I do not know exactly how this food was made. I told someone who may have told someone else to get the most food they could for the cheapest price. And, and they did that. Now, I, I do have strict policies in place. I told them not to spit on that food or to rub their balls on that food. <laughs> and I've trusted them to abide by that. So I want you to look at this suspiciously cheap food that lands on your desk tomorrow. And I want you to f***ing eat it. And if you're thinking, well, I can't do that, I don't know where it came from, what if someone rubbed their balls on it? 
then I don't know what to tell you other than now do you understand the importance of supply chain management. <laughs> but why am I telling you about your lunch when I can show you? Introducing the spring collection of your lunch tomorrow. First, please welcome Dave. Uh, Dave is wearing an Old Navy shirt and shorts. Uh, his total outfit uh, costs just $23.78, and he's carrying the frighteningly cheap sushi platter that will be arriving at your office tomorrow. Thank you, Dave. Uh, let's move on to Walmart. Uh, Christian is modelling both a summer maxi dress available for under $15 and a tray of flouters that we got for just $1.75 each, which is so close to being free, it's literally nauseating. <laughs> Moving on to J -J 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 Joe Fresh. And Austin is pairing a sweatshirt and casual pant that cost under $40. How is it so cheap? It's a mystery, much like the contents of that gigantic pile of cheap dumplings that you will be eating tomorrow. Thank you, Austin. <laughs> Let's move on to our H&M collection. We paired Haley's sub-$20 jeans and blouse with shrimp and salmon pastry for five, which will be genuinely arriving at your Stockholm offices tomorrow. Um, I'm guessing that you will smell it before it gets into the room. And finally, thank you, thank you. Finally, please welcome the children's place and say hello to Elliot. She's wearing an adorable white summer dress which costs less than $15. And at what's that she's pulling? That would be your lunch, a selection of dirt cheap rotisserie chickens. <laughs> Just to reiterate, I have no idea where they came from or what might have happened to them along the way. But Elliot sure wants you to eat them, isn't that right, Elliot? Exactly. So eat them. Eat. Eat them. Eat this wagon of mystery chickens.